Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Oh, you got it perfect. I don't have an introduction because I've got this great crutch, pound and 10 ounce crutch that I can just pounce into and start reading. But what I want to do, I, I wanted to structure a selection from the book based on what I found uh, upstairs, 15 feet from where I stand, and you know, where Heather works in the archives. And there are some things that I'll describe a little more closely, how no one, and besides now the people reading the book, are able to have found out what Bill said about certain things at that time. We thought that they were lost and they were found because of that archive. But I want to start with the great romance. You suck in readers with romance. And Bill and Barbara had a fantastic romance. They met at Medford High School. But before that, Bill Barman had to join the human race because he was raised by women. His folks divorced when he was two. His mother took him back to Fossil and raised him up without the help of a man. Thank you very much. He had strong mother, strong uncles, especially, especially strong grandmother who was born. Uh, she crossed the Oregon Trail, as Jay Bowerman puts it, in utero. She was born in 1845 on the banks of the Willamette when the wagon train finally made it to Oregon City. So Bowerman was true pioneer stock. And, uh, but the consequence of not having a father made Bill difficult. And so I will begin with something that kind of will explain a little bit about that. His sister, his older sister by three years was uh, named Beth. And when uh, he became uh, high school age, uh, they moved to Medford from, actually from down in uh, Ashland to Medford to uh, get better schooling. Bill and, Beth, uh, Bill and Beth entered Medford High as freshmen and a senior, respectively. Bill was soon observed in playground battles. Beth had an equally familiar problem. Lizzie, her mother, uh, still her, allowed her no boyfriends and watched her with the relentlessness of the permanently charred. Beth dutifully trudged straight home every day, studied for hours, transferring whatever burgeoning desires she may have had into emulating her teachers. Four years later, she'd graduate Phi Beta Kappa from the University of Oregon in education and would go on to embody Lizzie's belief about how a woman's life ought to be conducted. She would teach, she would help others rear children, but she herself would have no truck with the deceiving gender. Years later, Barbara Barman likened Beth to a once juicy grape drying into a raisin. All three Bowerman children revered their mother. She was all they had, especially during the years after leaving Fossil. The older two each found a way to honor Lizzie's wishes, albeit in best case at some cost, not so Bill. At 15, Bill was as wild as his mountain man great-grandfather had been at that age, as ungovernable, he would say later, as most of us are when the threat assessment part of our brain is a few neurons short of a connection. <laughs> but he was worse. Circumstance had conspired to keep him from confronting his inner demons, and he grew, as he grew closer to becoming a man, he, a species his mother had taught him to distrust, his furies began to intensify. He sometimes fought with such ascending anger that it see, he seemed not to care whether he was killed in the process. In his sophomore year, his brawling led him to be uh, suspended from Medford High School, and Barbara, who wouldn't meet him for another two years, uh, suggests that he may have been overly aggressive. Not a bully, she said, but it's the responder who gets caught. 
Lizzie, I uh, couldn't do anything with him. A teacher herself, she would have thrown him out of her own classes as summarily as his own teachers had. And beyond that, she was at a loss because as she recoiled from asking any man to intervene. But finally, his older brother, Dan, seven years older, did what his mother would not. Bill, he sat Bill went down one day and told him he had an appointment, eight o'clock Monday morning with the superintendent of schools, Ursel H. Hedrick. Bill, having no choice, nodded. At the appointed hour, he was welcomed by Hedrick's secretary, given a chair, told to wait. He sat and was ignored. By noon, he was squirming. Barbara could imagine him in agony. She says that energy all balled up, going over and over what they might do to him, paddling him, whipping him. He could take that. Thrown out of school, he could live with that. Military school, he'd run away. And then, as Barman himself would always remember, the voice emanated from the inner sanctum. Is that hell-raising son of a bitch still out there? <laughs> Bill had barely crossed the threshold when Hedrick began hitting him with a profane list of his sins, delivered in a command voice that made his scalp crawl. Ursel H. Hedrick was then 30. He'd graduated from Oregon in 1916, had been a World War I Marine mule skinner and artillery officer, and standing above a stack of Bill's teacher's reports, he said, this is ridiculous. You're good in band. You're good in journalism. You're not stupid. You're just a hell-raising son of a bitch. <laughs> Bill, by his muteness, could only agree. Hedrick studied, studied the skinny, jug-eared creature. Bowerman, Hedrick went on, here's how life is going to go for you. You'll keep up this goddamn fighting, and you'll not only be out of Medford, you'll be out of goddamn everywhere, Grants Pass, Ashland. Nobody's going to stand for this shit, and that's the way it should be. You'll fight, and I'll be rid of you. You'll fight. Everybody else will be rid of you. Fight here, fight there, die in prison or some barroom floor. I could give a royal oozing shit. That's justice. That's just dying by your own goddamn sword. Bill reddened as if he could feel all those fights in his blood and welcomed them. <laughs> the only thing wrong with that, said Hedrick, is that you'll dishonor a goddamn worthwhile human being. Bill's head came up. Who? Elizabeth Hoover Bowerman. You will bring eternal shame upon the name of your mother, intoned Hedrick, and Bill's pallor became not of sickness but of death. What should I do, he finally croaked. What do you want me to do? Control yourself, roared Hedrick. Cut the crap, channel that goddamn energy. Go back to that school and be of use. Make your mother proud, because I swear to you, Bowerman, I never want to hear your goddamn name again. Bill stumbled across town, his system raging against itself. He thought of running away forever. He thought of killing himself. Neither would exactly thrill his mother. <laughs> At school, he was escorted to class by a grimly silent principal. He took his seat. He opened a book. The pages boiled before his eyes, but he willed the words into focus. Like his great-grandfather, he learned to accept, accept something short of perfect freedom. He began to channel. He threw himself into his studies, sports, the band, drama, the school paper. Hedrick's two-by-four of his life. Where would I be if they had categorized me at age 10, Barman would say, 50 years later, on jail or worse. Instead, he got nothing lower than a single B in his last two years of high school. Hedrick, he said, got my attention. Whether Bill swore to himself he would never lose control again isn't known, but this was the beginning of the self-possession that would strike anyone who met him thereafter. Bill's turnaround was so dramatic that Hedrick would, in fact, hear his goddamn name again. <clears throat> the 
Lizzie expected all her children to become musically competent. So at Medford, Bill went with a clarinet and joined the marching band, but he kept casting a covetous eye towards the gridiron, the one place he could hit and no one would complain. When he tried out during his freshman year, though, Coach Prince Prink Callison, noting his 105 pounds in the clarinet case, said, back to the band. <laughs> the next fall he went out again. Callison took another look and said, back to the clarinet, back to the band. Bill grew as if he willed it. Before his junior year, he was nearing six feet and weighed 170. There was a story he loved to tell in the end of summer. I were, this is him, a long quote from him. I worked in the packing plant with a guy named Woody Archer. He was a sophomore at Oregon. He'd played end at Medford. And one of my friends, friends and I were playing tennis on one court using balls, his balls. And Woody was playing somewhere else using my balls. And I got done, I wanted to leave. And I said, how long are you going to be playing, Woody? What difference does it make? Well, you're using my balls. I'd like to have you when, when you're through. He walked over and said, these aren't your tennis balls. Well, that WJB doesn't stand for Woody Archer. He made a fake like he was going to hit me, and I hit him right in the mouth, and his feet for, uh, flew out from under him, but he jumped right up again. We fought there for a half hour. He never hit me any place except the top of my head. He was throwing roundhouse rights, and every time I'd crouch and uppercut him, I had him bleeding like a pig. The police came, and we got taken down to the station to explain why we were fighting. There was no explanation. So they said, don't fight in the neighborhood and let us go, and we had another one. And, our, and Woody didn't learn a damn thing, and we got arrested again. <laughs> and when school started, someone brought me a message saying, Callison wants to know if you want to turn out for football now. <laughs> I'd beaten up the guy who'd been his starting end. Bill had jumped on a moving freight. Medford, under young Callison, had gone undefeated for four years. And Bill began as a guard because that's where the uh, depth char chart was thinnest. He played every minute of offense and defense. And Later he would loathe platoon football, saying you cannot understand the game without partaking of both sides. And when Callison asked if he could learn an injured center's plays, Bill said hey, he'd already memorized everyone's assignment on every play in the book. So Callison moved him to end, where he became the favorite target of a curly-haired quarterback named Al Melvin. 27 and 28 Medford teams went undefeated and twice won the state championship by lopsided scores. And in 27, after Bill had kneed and hacked through Ashland for the winning touchdown, the losing coach asked Callison where this wildcat had come from. Got him off the band, Callison said. <laughs> Watching from the Medford bleachers in Bill's senior year was a 14-year-old sophomore, Barbara Young, who had just transferred from a cultured all-girls prep school in Chicago. I had never been, even been in a school with men teachers, she would say. I'd never, or boys running around loose. Back east, her father had taken her to University of Chicago games, but she had cared more about the fur coats and the chrysanthemums. But in Medford, she said, I got to see these great big creatures in action, and I confess, I exulted. She was not alone. And this is Barbara, a long paragraph from Barbara. My Aunt Margaret and her folks, and my folks, were in the orchard crowd, doctors and professional people who had pear ranches. Several had girls of my age, so after one football game, there was a dinner party. The Roberts girls gave it at the Colony Club, where only the upper echelon belonged. In her trepidation, Barbara skipped the football game to get a private dance lesson. I'd hated dance school in Chicago, all white gloves, and the boys and girls standing across a vast room, and the fear of not being chosen, and the fear of being chosen. The Medford party dined at elegantly chic tables, each seating four. Maids distributed plates weighty with prime rib, baked potatoes, and Waldorf salad. Just behind me at another table, Barbara remembered years later, was this football player. What caught my eye was that every time a maid would bring him a dinner, he'd thank her, and when she, she'd gone, he'd slip it onto his knee. And then he'd smile a beatific smile at another and get another dinner. And the boy, a tall senior named Bowerman, 
handed up with a meal on each knee and one on the table, all three of which he wolfed down by dessert, neatly stacking the plates before him. When the dancing began, the boy came over. Standing there, he wordlessly offered Barbara his hand. She took it. Nothing at dance school had prepared her for what came next. He was strong and sensitive. At first, it was wonderful, but it was dead silence, sepulchral silence. Now I know he grew up in a silent home. I was shy, but at least we talked in my family. <laughs> When she couldn't stand it anymore, she said, you must have been hungry. <laughs> oh no, he said, ate dinner before I came. <laughs> they danced on without another word. He was always a great dancer, Barbara would remember, always musical, always a graceful athlete. And then Barbara's nerves melted away and were replaced by feeling new to her experience. More than anything in high school, I wanted acceptance. And on that floor, with his hand at my back, guiding me, I'd never felt so relaxed. I felt unconditionally accepted. And the music stopped. They parted with awkward nods and rejoined their table. In that beginning, in the beginning, Barbara would say, she and Bill shared a similar sort of yearning. At that age, we had absolutely no self-esteem. Both of us had been raised by stern parents, my mother had been brought up a hard shell Baptist, all hell and damnation. Bill revered his mother, but she was full of expectations and all fossil had urged him never to let her down because she'd had it so hard. I'd seen him in classes in the halls. I remember that hungry look in his eye, that lonely look. That first meeting did foretell a small part of their future. Bill and Barbara would love each other wholly, even as they remained mystified by each other. Their dance would often be as wordless as its first steps, each wondering what the other could possibly be thinking. But Barbara's uncommon gift was to be, to be aware. It was just like her to notice the shenanigans of some guy sitting with his back to her. It was also just like her to find the phrases to engrave an experience in memory, to name, to clarify. She would be the perfect balance to build tactical taciturnity. <clears throat> One of the things that are in the library uh, is a complete collection of Bill's papers for the Eugene Roundtable. He was one of the, I think he was the only varsity coach who was ever invited to be a member of the Roundtable. And uh, when people ask me, to, and, and they, I, I say that my feeling for language, a great deal of my feeling for language and the music of language and the love of language came from Bill Bowerman, they are often ask me, to give me an example, what sort of language, because he's not exactly famous uh, for, for his writing, and uh, maybe he could be m much better read, but uh, I found a passage in a wonderful, I think it's his best paper. I'm looking for 352. Um, witnesses to Bill's daily life in the late 70s insisted he never let concerns over Nike's direction uh, interfere with his radiating contentment. Such irritants were nothing with, compared with the joys of his burgeoning farm. Sheep, sheep were fine lawnmowers and provided wool for Barbara's spinning and knitting. He observed the problems and rewards of the Jacobs Hereford cattle opera not do better. He raised chickens. He tried to keep a goat, but he refused to have any animal smarter than he was on the property. <laughs> After it learned, he, it learned to climb trees to outwit him, he served it at a faculty barbecue, calling it venison until it was eaten. Um, he spoke and wrote about all this in a tone derived less from Thomas Jefferson than Will Rogers. And in 1978, he rose and delivered his greatest round taper and table paper entitled Gallus Gallus. And um, uh, uh, this is all 
Bill Bowerman, unless I interrupt and say it's me. This is not a report for feminists, he began. Rather, it is research and flight of the imagination concerning men and cocks or roosters. It is my purpose to raise large chickens that lay lots of eggs and do not crap in the carport. <laughs> in keeping book on chickens and isolation of the genes, for one, big birds, two, lots of eggs, three, the mess in the carport, it's necessary to isolate individuals or pairs. But how do you tell who lays and what? According to Paige Smith in a book named The Chicken, if you look at a chicken's vent and it's a dull saffron, the hen is probably not laying. However, it's ro if it's roseate red, it is likely a laying hen. I tried this several times. I picked up each hen, I turned her tail back and looked, and almost without exception, the vent would wink at me. <laughs> Not just once, but several times. I stopped this practice because as Knight Duncan once remarked of an English laird, there's nothing queer about Chumley and I did not want the reputation of being queer with chickens. <laughs> so how do you tell who lays and who goes into the pot? I found another authority. Ulisse Androvalvi Aldrovandi of Verona found in his research that when the hen is held in one hand, if two fingers can be laid at the vent, the hen is a layer. If, however, there's room for only one figure, finger, the prospect is for the pot. I tried this method. I picked up a nice hen. I presented her backside, laid my index and third finger in the pelvic crease. The hen got an alarmed expression, squawked, and took flight. <laughs> After more trials, I learned the Aldrovandi method simply causes the hen's eyes to bug out and they continue to look with some suspicion on the examiner thereafter. <laughs> I isolated a single hen in her apartment for four days. My grandmother said a hen with a rich red full comb is a layer. and my testing by the solitary confinement method has proved without a doubt my grandmother knew more than either Paige, Paige Smith or Aldrovandi. And for 15 pages, Bill lavished this kind of style on his method, methods of selecting eggs for incubation, qualities of breeding stock. Quote, starting with Rhode Island Reds, a banty for setting and white leghorns, what did I get? The hybrid vigor I am seeking. A rooster which weighs eight pounds, white with a mantle of red, he seems to have received, like Elisha, a double portion of the spirit. Released from a pen, I have seen him service a flock of pullets on the hillside in less time than it takes an Oregon runner to cover a mile. <laughs> Bill covered the world records for egg laying, his adoption of a brooder that could accommodate 50 chicks, and revealed that his fascination with genetics went back to his biology professor, Ralph Eustace. And I quote, many people inquire about the apparent superiority of black athletes over whites and whether this has to do something like, with something like a longer Achilles tendon, Bill wrote. And Ralph would reply not to speak specifically about the tendon or physical characteristics of the races, but it may be evidence of hybrid vigor. He included a page of Mendelian hereditary probabilities, explaining why it takes five generations for a trait to breed true. He dilated upon his methods for controlled experiments, keeping the birds in different portable cottages, which he called Galleria from Columella. He gathered eggs daily, weighing, measuring, dating, and recording them. He found that Pliny the Elder had preceded him in finding that long eggs hatched into roosters, and round ones, excuse me, that's backwards, into hens, and round ones into a rooster. There's a modern study, he quote, going on today in Sweden on the production of square eggs. The theory being that a dozen square eggs would pack into a smaller space. I, Bill wrote, join the hens in being unalterably opposed. <laughs> now certainly, a scientific study would be required to produce not only hens with square vents, but also cocks with square, no, the idea is preposterous. <laughs> He addressed the issue of predators, which included the fox, the possum, and even his four-year-old grandson, who Bill said has been thoroughly trounced twice by the red rooster. And then there was this one long adventure. About a year ago, I was losing one chicken each night to something 
large enough to mash down the chicken country condominiums, which were designed after a great horned owl settled in on silent wings and took the head off a Jersey giant pullet. I've made no numerous nocturnal defense sallies armed with buckshot. Only twice have I had the wily rascal in my beam. Finally, in midsummer, the distress, distress calls awakened me. Grabbing my arms, I hurried to the defense. I caught the eyes in the flashlight. Before I could get the shotgun into position, they were gone. I walked around the house, scanned a maple tree, and then the lawn. Two coals of fire appeared. Slowly, I raised the gun and let fly. The recoil raised the gun and the light, and I said to myself, that so-and-so won't go far. And then, from Lady Barbara's flower, flower planting around the edge of the lawn, I heard a hissing. Snakes, I thought. But the light beam revealed a fountain. I'd blown a hole in the plastic pipe two inches <laughs> under the ground. Blaspheme and fire, I raged. I shut off the main line and went to bed. <laughs> He ended with a, a coda that I find has surpassing sweetness. Some of the good things that come off researching with chickens include night hunting, coon fried chicken, cockfights, and some of the richest fertilizer known to horticulture. I move my portable gallery every six or seven days. It takes 15 minutes and is wonderfully good for our shallow soil. It never fails to bring the nostalgia of boyhood and walking through the chicken yard barefoot. No sensation is more memorable than the flow between the toes. <laughs> For some time, friends would ask whether he had isolated that toughest gene, the non-carport crapping one. <laughs> and he would say, not quite yet, and ask them to walk the edges of the carport and look for droppings that were flat on one side. And that would show some subject was halfway there. <laughs> And later, Jay Barman would say, you absolutely could not understand his father's sense of humor without seeing a video of Al, the black-tailed rooster, to the accompaniment of Misty River Bluegrass Band servicing a pair of snow-white Nike Cortezes. I'll finish with the last thing. Um, in 75, after Steve Prefontaine died, we had to do a um, memorial service here. There was a funeral in Coos Bay and a service here, and Bill was part of that. But his, what he said was, I thought, lost. Um, he had written a draft and then spoken from a second draft in his yellow uh, legal pad. But uh, KUGN had not recorded his exact words. And uh, when we did the movie, which we had a scene in there, it ends with his speech after Pree's death. Uh, we went to him and we said, do you remember what he, you said? And he, in general, he did. Um, but he couldn't find his uh, notes. So I thought they were lost until 15 feet above my head, my partner, Connie, discovered what uh, the long quote at the end of this little section will be. We'll end with that. Uh, where am I? 326. At 7 a.m. on May 30th, 1975, we awoke to the shock of our lives. The Prefontaine had been killed in a one-car accident on Scar Skyline Drive no more than a minute after dropping Frank off at my house, Frank Shorter. We walked down through neighbors' yards to the scene. The car had been removed by then, but there was broken glass on the street. We saw the accident report and learned he'd struck a natural outcropping black basalt. He had not been wearing his seat belt. The car had flipped over, coming to rest on that great chest. He had not broken a bone. The weight of his beloved butterscotch MGB had simply pressed the life out of him. If anyone had found him then in the first five minutes, he or she might have saved him with a two by four and a brick. Pre had to have left this world with a fine regard for its absurdities, one being that he was dying on a road he loved to run, on a hill where he made others suffer. His last moments surely recapitulated his finest races, his blacksmith bellows gasping, his fighting down panic, his approaching death's door, 
is needing the crowd to call him back. Neil Steinhauer, on his way to the ministry, had talked with him a week before at the Modesto Relays about the seeming disorder of his life and priorities. Steinhauer ever since has hoped that he did enough, hoped that in Pree's last moments his mind turned to the Almighty. The Coos Bay funeral was extravagant to the point of circus, uh, with Pree's hearse doing a lap of the Marshfield track at about 70 pace. One pallbearer, John Anderson, was made so furious by the fear-mongering preacher saying, get right with God, who among us is safe if our strongest can be taken in an instant? that John, uh, John started knocking on the side of the casket and said another bearer, Mike Manley, I thought Pre was coming right up out of there. Bowerman, as he had in Munich, watched with Barbara from high in the stands and afterward he told us the Oregon Track Club would hold a memorial on Hayward Field two days later, June 3rd. Haggard in a way he had not been in Munich. He said that he would say a few words but that the rest of the program should be up to the athletes. The next day we cast a wide net, assembled all Prefontaines we could think of at our house to see who should say what. And we ended up with 20 people in a circle, all pointing at each other and saying, you knew him better than I did. Pat Tyson had lived with Pre for two years but felt he went to Frank and me for guidance. We were startled to hear that and we said we suggested ideas about the AAU but we never felt intimate. He loved to stay over at Mark Feig, Steve Benz's apartment, but they said he came in so late and got up so early they practically never saw him. Jeff Hollister, driven all over the state with him doing running talks, never knew until that moment that Pre had started a running club at the Oregon State Prison. We were stunned. Great quadrants of him were not knew, known to more than a few. The memorial service, we decided, would be the opposite of the funeral. It would be all about him and it would be fast and it would give him one thing he never got in running, which was the world record. At twilight, June 3rd, 4,000 mourners assembled in the East Stands. They received a card saying clock would be started and Pree's fellow Olympians, Powerman Shorter and Moore would speak for 10 minutes and leave the field and then the clock would stop at 12.36, a time with which Steve Prefontaine would be well satisfied. It was the 63 pace he'd spoken of as a goal, and it was 11 seconds faster than Emil Puttemann's uh, three-mile world record. The scoreboard clock where Pree's eyes had always gone as he hit the line was under the control of Bill Dellinger's brother, Fred. Seconds began to whip by. Bowerman began. He was shaky at first, an image of the wrongness of a father burying a son. Friends, he said, let us be grateful that we were a part of what Steve Prefontaine, the champion, stood for, what he enjoyed and what he achieved. Thanks to his mother and dad for giving him those characteristics of truth, honesty, intensity, physical ability. I first knew of Pre through Walt McClure when I was his coach in Pacoose Bay. When he was 14 years old, Walt said, watch this freshman, he's tough, he'll be a good one. Four years later, when he was a freshman, there was the early fall rain Pre had finished his orientation lecture. Dressed in sweats, he was walking in the halls of Mac Court. From inside the arena issued the undertones of the radical student unrest. Catcalls, rude questions, foot shuffling. Pre looked in and said to me, I don't believe it. He walked to the stage and asked, may I speak? He was handed the mic. I am a freshman. I chose Oregon. I listened to the orientation. I came to get an education and to run. Listen, listen, you'll learn something. Thanks. I'm glad I came to Oregon. Uh, and then this is Bowerman going on. His great races are told better by the press and media. His desire burned to be the best, and he was. Step by step, as he matured, he reached his goals. In high school, he was state champion and national record holder. In the university, he held every American record from 2,000 meters, 2 miles, through 6 miles, and 10,000 meters. In 1976, his goal was Olympic champion and the world records related thereto. But he also burned with another great goal, emancipation, freedom for the U.S. athlete. Tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars were his for the signing of a professional track contract. No, help the athlete, help the sport. Barman went on about how Prefontaine had done that by challenging track and field's resistance to change. 
In the history of our sport, he went on, no one man had ever been permitted to arrange and bring a foreign athlete or team to the United States. The door was always locked by national red tape and dictatorship. Pre opened the door by persistence, difficult communication. You saw the Finnish athletes competing in uh, like three days before. Theirs was the first such visit in a century. His legacy to us is truth, honesty, and hard work, work that the good things of track and other sports may be freely enjoyed by athletes and spectators. Pre, the little champion, opened the international door. I pledge to Pre, and I know those close family and friends join me. We all invite, we invite all true sportsmen to fulfill his great dream, freedom to meet in international sport and friendship. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm. I understand there to be questions. <laughs> Maybe not, maybe not. <laughs> I was remiss when I introduced him, not to introduce his partner. Honey, where are you? There you are. Please stand up. <laughs> Who are the other half of the scene? <clears throat> she just... <clears throat> <laughs> Mayor, of course, a dear family, friends with the Bowermans. And Connie, I should say, it was Connie who found that last quote from Bill. So we have it for history. Uh, Bill's exact words are preserved. What was the hardest thing about writing it? Uh, the hardest thing about writing it, I don't know, and keeping faith, keeping the sense of pace that uh, there wasn't, I was going along pretty well, I don't think any chapter took me much more, there are 30 chapters, I don't think, um, three weeks maybe was the longest, but uh, when you're writing you get uh, where you're really conscious of the problems that you're solving right at that moment, and if you're, if you're not solving them in a day or two, and then you just got all this other big long book hanging over your head, that was something to push away. But uh, then I would just go to the four or five notebooks that Barbara Barman uh, I had accumulated at her knee with my, the only um, cramp, people say, don't you, signing books doesn't give you writer's cramp. No, no, writing notes when Barbara Barman is dictating gives you <laughs> writer's cramp. And uh, I'd read those and they were so good, they were so wonderful that any and all uh, doubts about my own worthiness or doubts about whether I could solve a momentary problem would pale compared to what uh, basically was lying there ready to be laid out and done and read. I never, I feel about the book the way we used to feel about great long runs. People have a hard time, some people are not built to run have a hard time understanding how there's no discipline involved in going out and running a great energetic 30 mile run. And, uh, but for me there wasn't, I, you know, if you were able to do it, it wasn't like it was easy, it wasn't like it was fun, but it was a vigorous uh, usage of my personal design that was thrilling and uh, the book was very, very similar. There was no sense of sacrifice in the writing of this book. We bought a house here. <clears throat> we bought an old white cottage on the corner of 28th and Kincaid, so we're not going bad. We rented out the, the, the financial possibilities of the, the, the book was made possible by the fact that we could rent out our beautiful house in Hawaii for enough to pay that mortgage 
and rent a little uh, garret here in O2. And, uh, but we've gotten to the point where uh, hey, we're Oregonians, and so 28th and Chambers is two blocks from the Amazon Trail, trail it's four blocks, four blocks from the uh, Sundance wine shop. <laughs> So lucky I got you know, over to the university. <laughs> but that doesn't answer your question. That just slide, sidestepped. I, I don't know. I'm looking at a bunch of different projects. Um, one of the things that kept the book from being along uh, quicker, you know, was 9/11. Uh, just got me off, uh, knocked me off base. And uh, so I wrote a script for a guy that based, you know, the things you were, I was thinking about had to do with that. And uh, so that may be something that I can return to. Um, the other Bauer, I met a wonderful biology professor, a wonderful person, another Bowerman, Bruce Bowerman, who I think is related through the, uh, the Bowermans, um, built, would be built through his dad in Iowa, family in Iowa. He's a biology professor. And so we got, I mean, he's so good at cooking up these ideas and futurizing scripts and things. We might take a shot at something. I'm sure he'd be astounded to hear me saying this. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> it's one of the various actors you consider for various movies that look about the book. Oh, God, though. No. <laughs> I apologize for the order that all this has come in because obviously you should never have tried a movie about pre without a book anything about pre without doing bill first um, Roscoe Devine Phil Knight Kenny Moore all of us are understood through bill and that went even more so uh, for pre so uh, the proper order was I should have been finished with this in about 92 and we should have leapt to do the pre movie then, but I wasn't. In fact, it was, I was working on it then, but I got dragged away from it. That slowed it down a little bit, too. But it, made, it enriched it, too. It made me uh, better at uh, uh, the, dram uh, the dramatics and dealing with dramatic structure than I would have been just as a journalist. It seems to me uh, Bowerman's greatest talent in coaching was to inspire athletes to run through their threshold of pain. Uh, did you find that? I think so because he didn't necessarily say pain. He he resisted saying pain. He said discomfort. He, he just you know he just wanted you to you know next time you know he would never say oh you were so cowardly or anything. Next time you'll be a little better prepared. You know next time you'll be a little stronger from whatever you went through. It was uh, something that let you push yourself rather than, and to the, obviously we all wanted to push ourselves, we all wanted to be really good, and uh, he didn't, he never gave a pep talk, he just was a colleague, he never f wanted artificial emotion, he just felt that was silly, if we were prepared, we knew what we were doing, our training, our drills, our practice marks, our strategies, our studies of the other guys, all of that was so good that he just talked about nuts and bolts, and He'd say the same thing when a uh, bus ride to, um, yeah, I'm sure uh, you remember this, maybe even in high school. Um, he would say, um, and it wasn't necessarily on the point, uh, the, uh, the Greek mothers, when the Greek soldiers, ancient Greeks, went off to battle, their mothers would say, will you just come home bearing your shields in victory or you come home being born on your shields in defeat, meaning you fight to the death. And I remember Mel Renfro once said, hard, weren't those? Greek mothers were hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what Bill meant was we were not going to come back as corpses. That some of us would uh, do better than we thought we were going to do. Some would do worse, but afterwards we could sit, we could talk about what happened, what you could do better the next time whether it was technique, whether it was some other thing, everything was addressable. It was an ongoing thing that you got, and the end of which you got better and better and better. Oh, excuse me. 
I was drifting off. <laughs> Medford, exactly, yeah. Um, these, so, some of the stories that I've heard have been so uh, sort of enlightening about who he was as a person. Do you have one that you would, I don't want to put you on the spot, but. I got a whole book, I got a whole book. People kind of reach that far back than you have, so. He was the first uh, track coach Medford ever had because they didn't have one. And, and Barbara always blamed this sequence for, uh, or he always, or Barbara always complained that Bill always blamed her, that if he was not a doctor, it was her fault because she agreed to marry him and live and be a teacher's wife in Medford, Oregon. But he was really only teaching for a couple of years there because he had admission to the med school, but he couldn't afford it. And so uh, he was teaching and Hedrick, the, the, the story is wonderful symmetry because the guy, the superintendent who just hammered him into channeling, hired him to be the football coach for Medford. And after he had won the first year, the uh, had done a really good job with the first year team, uh, he said, also it's past time that we have a track and track program, so Bill was put in charge of that. Bill, that was his honeymoon, was going and looking at different tracks and in Southern California with Barbara. And, uh, but he, he basically did everything in this very, very quick time was of the essence. And I remember Bob Newland, who was uh, coached by him in Medford a little bit later, but he, they, one of their sort of favorite stories, the way coaches would pass them down, was that how um, Bill insisted for the first time that the high school meets would proceed according to the time they were supposed to. That you, when we had the hundred started to schedule, they would be run at 2:05, and we would proceed from there on. And so one day, the Grants Pass bus it draws up, and the Grants Pass team comes out, and the Grants Pass coach says, "God, this is a great day for." track meet and Bill says it is, it is, and we've already run this event and this event and you're behind <laughs> 17, 21 to nothing, obviously. <laughs> um, and the guy never showed up late again, but he imposed his, his own, he, and, and all of us are thing you, you learn, Barman, you, he wanted you there. On time, you'd have team meetings at some strange time, 4.27 p.m., because it just to stick in your mind that time was important. The individual minute is important. I don't have a great cascade of high school stories because when I was collecting, I, I kind of had a short, a short, um, what? A small basket for those because I already knew when I was researching his high school stories the tonnage of great stories after high school. But he and Barbara and the Frohnmeyers, their neighbors, they all say that was the greatest days of their life. They just were absolutely in their element, doing what they love to do, raising their kids, just having a blast and, and doing very well at it. So in terms of the emotions and un, untrammeled, uncompromised, Blee, gliss, gliss or blee, one of those. <laughs> Neither of those. Glee, that was it for them. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm not mistaken, he was in the tent. Not in the you are not mistaken, very, yes. What, what do you have to say about that? Well, that's a, that was a chapter that took three weeks because he was an extraordinary hero, won the Silver Star, won three Bronze Stars, saved several people. Uh, the Lafferty's owe a lot to him because he got Ralph Laffert, Lafferty to surgery when he, he probably would have died had not Bill just taken over. Um, Bill negotiated, Bill started out uh, fittingly for a man who grew up around mules. Um, and he was in supply in the tent in the mountain. They used mules to carry their uh, even their artillery, and so uh, when he were supply, but, but as the war went on and his 
fighting abilities became known, they gave him a fighting company, an infantry company. And so he led the great charge when the, when the lines broke in mid-May uh, 1945 and the Germans were retreating across the Po Valley to the Alps. Uh, they had to be stopped and he, he and his group were out trying to keep them from burning bridges. And, um, he was asked to use his his initiative as seemed proper, and so he ended up demanding and getting the surrender of the 14th German Army, um, just because he had the nerve uh, to talk his way through the German lines, both the, just the regular German lines and the SS lines, and because he was a major by that time, and he kept telling this lieutenant, this German SS lieutenant, I outrank you, you will call your general. And then he got through. It wasn't he did not do that, just on a wild gamble. He had picked up word of a messenger colonel that the general had sent back to headquarters in Germany that they were basically asking for permission to withdraw and retreat and give up if necessary. So Bill was, um, he suspected that he would, his, his statements or demands would be agreed upon, but it was, it was complicated. There were Italian partisans that were going to kill the Germans as soon as they put down their uh, weapons. And so Bill had to work it out with the Germans, how the Americans would control the partisans and then the Germans would feel safe enough. And then they would come marching down. But uh, like 4,000 men of the 14th German Army presented themselves to Bill and about as many people as that are, are in this room, and they had to control them. And the Germans had much better food, and blankets, and things at the end of the war. So it was, as Bill wrote to Barbara, a very rich experience there towards the end. So I've gone on too long, but yes, he was in the Tenth Mountain. <laughs> That's another movie right there. Well, thank you, thank you so much. There's so many. Mm. Mm.